you know how sometimes you see somebody that you think is really awesome and they're with like some schlep and that could be male or female you know like some really great guy some really great woman and they're with like some you know kind of just schlep <laughs> you know jerk eh, meathead something like that there is a reason actually and it's because um, I think everybody gets lonely sometimes and um, the thing is that and I think this may be more true of men than women but I could be wrong and I'm ready to be corrected is that these smart sensitive um, really incredible you know men persons who have a full operating humanity and a full range of emotions and they're just very in tune are so afflicted with self-doubt or as Evad Rotras says it's the artistic temperament somebody who's obviously so friggin talented but they're just paralyzed with self-doubt oh my god um, that okay you actually have the wherewithal to question whether or not you're good enough. And you know, there's nothing wrong with questioning, am I doing my best? I think I think we have to change the kind of the tone and the language, like am I doing my best? You know, to show up in, in a way that's um, positive and am I growing and all of that. But so while some folks achieve analysis paralysis by wondering if they're good enough to show up in the deal and uh, end up backing away because of self-doubt well it gets lonely and then these individuals these really awesome sweet kind men or women end up with a schlep who doesn't have the wherewithal to question whether or not they're good enough yeah, just saying. So, um, if you're one of those persons who questions these kind of things, and then please move forward in spite of your doubt, and just know that your self-doubt is, is, is a sign that you're absolutely, definitely worthy. For sure. Please. You know, we don't want the future of humanity to be bred all from schleps. Just saying, we need to survive. Ugh, fix the hair. Okay. There's a lot of uh, ambient noise here. The traffic. Okay. Okay. So, since we really haven't had time to organize a walk or anything, um, And it's not just with you. It's it's like a really um, important topic. Um, I have been thinking about it a lot, actually. About I've heard, you know, this worthiness. Am I worthy? Or I'm not worthy. Or I get stressed when I beat myself up. I get it. Believe me. <laughs> Hey, I've lived lived the program, but um, just thinking about it, you know, beating oneself up. That's like Fight Club. I got a you know, thing there and everything. So, um, in terms of worthiness, exactly how great do we have to be in order to like deserve to just have a simple, relatively normal, peaceful, happy existence. Like, really. I, I think that the way we've been raised is it's, it's a really skewed perspective. And, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, all of these societal expectations, there's something in the background that's distracting me. Um, 
what are these societal expectations? Uh, because every society on the planet is different. I mean, you know, compare um, living in North America, um, living in Mexico, which is, you know, again, North America, move somewhere else on the planet. Like, I mean, there's all these different expectations of men, women, children, you know, I mean, there's places in the world where children go and work in factories, right? So, um, I don't, don't think that we should impose the madness of society anywhere near our humanity in terms of what is expected of us. Um, I'm not a big fan of religion just because of all the, the havoc that it causes when people uh, view their religion as the only way and then they exclude others and all that condemnation and stuff that goes on. But if we were ever going to embrace something, I think religious values would be better than overall societal roles and values. And essentially, I mean, if, I mean, the teachings at least of the Christian faith is, you know, that your God loves you just the way you are. You were born into it, right? So, I guess what I'm trying to do is, I almost feel like I'm, um, doing the Dr. Peterson route here where I just kind of babble on and on and on and I don't really get to my point until the last few paragraphs of the chapter. <laughs> but um, I think that if you're born here, then you're deserving. You're born here. We're here for a reason. And even if that's only to be a creature. So uh, if you don't believe in anything beyond uh, anything, any greater meaning to life, and uh, excuse me. Anyway, um, we're at least born here to be a creature, and um, creatures mate. You know, all creatures, except for the ones deep in the sea, and they're asexual and whatnot. But I think the closer they go to the surface of the sea, then they can actually morph become sexual and, and divide into, you know, opposite sexes, so to speak. So, we are here to mate, and uh, we are here to love, and um, human beings are here definitely for love, uh, not just for mating, that's the biological thing, but uh, human babies, it's been shown um, through studies in orphanages, actually die without touch. biological reason and uh, biological and psychological reason why actually we can experience fight or flight response stress response in order uh, to become intimate and and that's because instinctively when we're born we know that we are completely dependent and that we will die without the care of um, our tribe you know someone at least someone out of the tribe we know that. We're, we're vulnerable, um, entirely helpless creatures. And so beyond even the physical care, because if we do get the physical care, you know, the food and we're kept warm, um, uh, if, if there's not enough touch, babies die. So um, that is why, especially if there's any early trauma at all, that we can experience becoming close to another human being as um, a threat to survival. It, it triggers that whole fight or flight kind of response because as we um, approach love, we know that if we are not loved, loved, cared for, accepted, whatever, you know, into the group, that we won't survive. And it's true because um, I think it's probably very, very rare that an individual, one person all alone, can survive on this planet um, without any help, any knowledge. Say, here's some tools to use to hunt that wild boar. You know, <laughs> I mean. So I think it's still very much um, part of our biology, and it's part of reality for us that we can't survive without that, and that's why. 
because to be rejected, actually, being rejected lights up the same part of the brain on an MRI as physical pain. And with how it all relates to being part of the tribe and being um, allowed to survive, it makes sense. So for all of you skeptics out there, um, there's a lot of science to back this up now, so. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to link it in the comments below. You can go find it out for yourself or you can just, you know, dismiss me. <laughs> Give shit, really. Um, but, so, there has been a couple of really important people. Well, more than just a couple, but there's a couple of really important people close to me um, where this topic of not worthy has been um, really prominent. And my feeling is that, well, if you're a basically kind human being and you're doing your best to be kind in this world, you're doing your best on any given day to show up without harming anyone, why the heck isn't that good enough? Jesus Murphy. You know, I mean, I was thinking, okay, like, well, if you're not some random serial killer, blah, 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 but, <laughs> I mean, even those folks, something really not right happened in their past. So, again, um, they wouldn't be the kind of person you'd maybe line up to hang out with, but do they actually deserve to be tortured or any worse than they already are? Because obviously, they are. You want to keep them away from other people, of course, so they don't do any more shit, but... It's just kind of ridiculous, I think, overall. And it's been long enough now. I mean, I experienced hating myself, like actually really, really hating myself. From when I was really quite young, like kindergarten, to, uh, I'd say it probably started to lift at some point in my mid-twenties, and, like, lift, but not free, and then sometime right around after I turned 40 that I was like, okay, I think I have suffered enough, I mean, for the mistakes that I've made. For the person I am, I've certainly paid my dues, and I was just tired of it. I just couldn't, I couldn't do the self-hate anymore. I couldn't do the self, uh, the beating myself up anymore. I just, I just, just don't have the energy for it. It's like life's short, <laughs> you know. And uh, I guess that's the whole thing. It's like you do it until you don't do it, but I think you should really try to not do it. And really try to look for that point where you're sick of doing it because yeah so I wrote this little poem about being worthy I guess yeah I guess so or about not being unworthy at least and uh, because of a typo I ended up calling it I bracket a mirror bracket there's a reason for that. There was actually a typo in the whole thing that I was like, maybe that was a sign. You are beautiful. That's all you need to know. Born with heart and soul and the sun on your face is gift enough to this world. And with this arrival, you deserve the world. My dear, to carry the world year after year in silence here, in a mirror, please see your heartbeat still pounding with mystery, bursting forth from the pores of your skin to bathe me in its energy. In itself, the mystery that moves life animates all sprouts and shoots in spring to push forth up out of the cold, wet, still frozen mud, this eternal life that in spite of tiny must be, must be, breaking the ground, breaking free to become something. You are fresh, beautiful, fragile, evolving with the unseen, 
just like that green shoot or sprout in spring, strong, and you deserve the world. Anyway, all I'm saying is, we're all plenty good enough, as long as we're not out constantly every day trying to axe hammer every person in our goddamn sight. Right? Okay, come on. Come on. And as uh, that wise man, Kareem, once said, <laughs> no, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> No, that'll be for another time. And as my wise friend Luther once said, close enough for rock and roll. That's what he used to say back in the day. And now it's evolved 30 some odd years later to it's close enough for the girls I've dated. <laughs> To my friend that I was uh, supposed to walk with sometime this week, again, um, I'm, you know, for you, this topic of um, inspiration and hesitation. So when you were on your trip, you had some inspired thought because you were inspired by what you saw and what you were experiencing. Um, now it's a completely normal brain function that when we hesitate, our brain almost locks and notices that. So it's, um, I forget the actual term for it, but I've come across it now, um, you know, two or three different sources about this, about how our brain works. Because our brain is like an organ of risk detection. And um, it has, you know, two parts. It has, you know, the, the small part at the front, the front of the cortex, which is conscious. And then it has, you know, like your reptile habit brain, you know, in the back that controls most of what we do most of the time. Um, so back in this reptile part, that's our fight or flight. Um, the advantage to that part of the brain is it reacts quickly. It's fast. Um, we don't have to think about pulling our hand away from like a hot flame. It just, it happens. Um, so that's the advantage. The disadvantage is that it, it's a program and if we don't, you know, um, learn the way to unpack that program and address it, um, then it, it runs our life. So, so here's the thing with the brain, uh, from what I've uh, been reading and hearing in the last, you know, couple of years is that we do, you know, hundreds of actions every day. So, you know, you know, you, you roll over, you get out of bed, you walk to the bathroom, you know, you put some clothes on put some shoes on and you do all of that without hesitation so when you actually think of something if you hesitate the brain goes there must be risk and then the brain goes into this whole other process where you're not even in your thinking like uh, most creative part of your brain anymore you're back in the reflex brain and it's trying to it magnifies identifies risk because it just simply wants to keep you alive and that part of the brain does not want you to do anything outside of your comfort zone. That part of the brain does not want you to do new things because there could be danger. And in our, you know, ancestry way back, I mean, that was lions, tigers, and bears. Um, we're in a really different time now. And so it's really important to understand how our brain functions and why sometimes it tries to shut us down. And the thing is, if if you have an inspiration and you don't marry it with an action within a few seconds, like even just saying yes or writing, like yes, I'm going to do that, or yes, I or write a note, okay, must look into moving here, et cetera, et cetera. So like whatever it is, um, must look into that particular course. As soon as you hesitate, the risk assessment brain kicks in and starts up. So. It's just something to keep in mind. And, well, it's more than something to keep in mind. It's something to really, I think, look into if you're a skeptic kind of person and you need to have the facts. They're all out there. There's so much information available about how our brains work now. And, um, and life is short. And, uh, you know, 
the only really rewarding, truly soul-fulfilling experiences that I've ever had. And I've been really fortunate to have had quite a lot of them have come from pushing forward, just acting and um, pushing past fear. Okay. Just saying, anyway, it's your life and it's up to you. But we need people. This world needs a lot more people like us. And so we don't want people like us making babies with schleps because then eventually the world's just going to become schleps. And there's a lot of them. It's a lot of them already, so.